much for inviting me and for everybody at the public uh, humanities at Western for organizing this. It's an exciting time to be with Al Jazeera uh, English. It's in a great place. We're in a very uh, accepted place. We've gotten a lot of positive praise. That hasn't always been the case, and I will, of course, talk about that today. Five years ago today, as Jamila said, today is an anniversary. Five years ago today, I was in the Broadcast Center in Washington, DC, and Al Jazeera English was, based on that picture, a minute and 50 seconds away from launching. So we gathered at 7 o'clock in the morning to be part of that launch. They were launching the, pro or the channel from Doha. That's where it was coming out of. We all gathered in our cent news center where we would be producing newscasts that night. And uh, we were very excited. It's on K Street, we're just a few blocks from the White House is where our broadcast center is. And we'd all gathered and come together to watch this moment. And I remember when it, a minute and 50 seconds after this picture was taken, we all got up and cheered. It was that exciting to be part of uh, such a historic moment in, in television. And I found yesterday a video of those first minutes. And I thought just to give you a taste of what it was like for us to watch five years ago today as the, as the first newscast went to air. I would play just a couple minutes for you, so I'll let you check that out. Welcome to Al Jazeera. It's November the 15th, day one of a new era in television news. I'm Shuli Ghosh. And I'm Sami Zaydan. This is Al Jazeera. Welcome to the world news from Al Jazeera and the very first program live from our Doha news headquarters here in the heart of the Middle East. In the next hour, we'll be going live to the world's top news stories. I'm Noor Aday in the Gaza Strip, which has been brought to the brink of chaos and despair by sanctions, siege and shelling. I'm Haru Mutasa in Darfur, scene of the world's worst humanitarian crisis. I'm Raghi Omar in Tehran. Could Iran's president really hold the key to peace in the Middle East? I'm Farai Savenza in Zimbabwe, where every day can be a battle for survival. On Al Jazeera, we'll be setting the news agenda. In this hour, we'll also be reporting from Brazil on an indigenous community with one of the highest suicide rates in the world. The Democratic Republic of Congo, where a disputed election could still lead back to civil war. And from Somalia, Africa's most dangerous city is peaceful for now, but for how long? We'll also go to Russia as George Bush starts his first foreign visit since defeat in the midterm elections. To Jerusalem for reaction to a fatal rocket attack on an Israeli town. On to Afghanistan, billions spent on rebuilding, but where's the money gone? And to China for a joyride with the boy racers of Beijing. So I just want to give you a taste of what it was like and the international scope of this TV channel. They went on for another about a minute or two just showing off all the different places we were going to be coming out of live in that first couple of hours of Al Jazeera English. And also showing off the world's, at the time, the world's biggest video wall in a newsroom, taking advantage of that. So on that day, Al Jazeera, the whole world was watching and the media around the world was watching as well. And there's tons of coverage about Al Jazeera English's launch. People were very excited about it in some parts of the world. Other parts of the world, particularly here in North America, people weren't so excited. Uh, and to, that's to put it mildly. And I thought I'd give you a little taste of what that was like. Um, my father, first day we launched, sent out an email. He was very excited about the launch. He was also a very proud father. He wanted everybody to know that his son was involved in the launch. So he sent out an uh, email to a bunch of his friends, letting them know that. And he sent a group email out to the Criminal Lawyers Association here in, Ont in T Ontario. He's a lawyer, sent it out to all his colleagues. One of them, who actually gets along with quite well, sent back this reply. It will be a dark day when Al Jazeera starts to be broadcast in North America. I guarantee you an effort to deteriorate support for the only democracy in the Middle East and a lessening of the will to combat terror in any effective way beyond the shores of North America. And he went on. Your son is undoubtedly talented and committed to doing a good job. His choice of employer would be laughable if it weren't so tragic. That's the kind of harsh personal attacks people felt about Al Jazeera, just from that name alone, just the day we actually launched. That already existed before we even got to air. And to be fair to this lawyer, he wasn't alone. A lot of people felt that way. There were a lot of really strong misconceptions out there about what Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera was about. 
So that's what we faced, and we've come a long way since then. And today I want to share some personal stories with you about that journey. And um, there's going to be three parts to my talk today. First, I'll give you a brief history of Al Jazeera. Then I'll talk about Al Jazeera English and its journey from infamy to acclaim. And lastly, I want to talk about why Canadians should be watching Al Jazeera and why, Canadians, why I think Canadians need Al Jazeera English. But first, I'll give you a little sense of what it was like in the early days of working for Al Jazeera English. Nine months before we launched, I moved to Washington, D.C. to uh, work for them. I got a job as the head output producer for the Americas. And just a few weeks later, my wife was hired to work at Fanshawe College, teaching fine arts, which was a little inconvenient because Washington and London is not quite close enough together for us. But we did the long distance thing for a year and, and put up with that. What it meant was that I was coming back to London a lot. I would commute back to London, and I'd fly from Washington to Detroit, rent a car, drive up to London. It's the cheapest way to go and the most efficient way to go. And I crossed the border a lot. And coming into Canada was never a problem. Going back the other way was problematic, let's say. I had Al Jazeera in my passport. <laughs> I don't recommend doing that if you don't have to. In the early days when I gave out my business cards, I would actually tell people to remember to take it out of their pocket before they cross the border. So it would always come up that I work for Al Jazeera and Al Jazeera English. Border guards, I don't think, quite understood the difference, and they would harass me. Now, it wasn't every time that I was harassed when I crossed the border, but it was often enough that I'd be pulled out of my car, uh, sent in for an interview, and my car would be completely searched, that I had to build an extra hour of time every time I crossed the border into the United States on my trip. It was, there was those kinds of strong misconceptions out there. And I've got to tell you, as a Canadian Jew, there's something a little bit bizarre about being suspected of being an Islamic terrorist. <laughs> Maybe it's just me, but... I, that's what I found, and that's what I had to put up with, because I had Al Jazeera in my passport, I have black hair, and I was considered public enemy number one. So that's what it was like in those early days, and those are the strong misconceptions, again, that were out there, and this, the border guards weren't special, that's how people felt in the States. I think in the States, a lot of parts of the country still feel that way today. So that brings me to, uh, uh, to today, and it, I want to talk about how Al Jazeera got this horrible reputation by 2006. And this part of my talk is called From, Infam from Acclaim to Infamy, which is not a typo. I know the talk is From Infamy to Acclaim, but the, that's, Infamy to Acclaim is the story of Al Jazeera English. The story of Al Jazeera is the story about going from acclaim to infamy. And that's a story a lot of people I don't think realize. Al Jazeera, what we now think of as Al Jazeera Arabic, there was only one channel until the English channel came along. So Al Jazeera started in 1996, and actually two weeks ago today, they celebrated their 15th anniversary. So it's been around for 15, 15, sorry, 15 years. Um, does anybody know what Al Jazeera actually means? The island? Yep. Anybody else? The peninsula. I think, the, the, I think it means both of those words in Arabic, actually. Uh, Al Jazeera got its name from the peninsula. It doesn't, didn't take the name because it means death to America. It doesn't mean down with the West. It means the peninsula. And if you look, Al Jazeera is headquartered in Qatar, and it is a peninsula in the Persian Gulf. It's that innocent, the name, but it strikes that much fear into people just because of the name. The reason the West was so excited when Al Jazeera came along is because it was a free press in the Middle East. The West really welcomed Al Jazeera in the early days. The United States, Britain, everybody was excited to have a free press in the Middle East. In the Arab world, television channels were arms of the government. They were basically government propaganda. You turn there, and you would never hear anything critical of an Arab government. Al Jazeera was different. They took on the Arab governments. They reported on multiple sides of the story. They actually presented balanced news. So the West was really excited about this. They did such a good job of presenting balanced news that countries in the Middle East were not so excited about it. Uh, they actually, several countries kicked Al Jazeera correspondents out of their countries. Some of the countries in the region, too, were so upset that they called the Emir of Qatar, who is the head of uh, Qatar, the head of the country that started Al Jazeera and runs Al Jazeera, they would call the Emir of Qatar and say, you have to do something about this. Al Jazeera is being critical of our government, or of our regimes. Do something about this. Stop them from broadcasting what they're saying. And the Emir refused to get involved. Then the countries in the region started taking diplomatic action against Al Jazeera. And diplomats from, sorry, against Qatar. Diplomats from Qatar were thrown out of countries. Still, the Emir of Qatar refused to interfere in the editorial content of Al Jazeera. So that's sort of where it was coming from. So, of course, the West was very excited about this. We all here in the West, we think of uh, journalism as one of the pillars of democracy. A free press 
is incredibly important to our democracy. And there we were in a part of the world that the West is really hoping democracy will take root, and there was a free press. So people were excited and, and they welcomed it. So when did that acclaim, that excitement about Al Jazeera, turn to concern, to complaints, to fear? September 10th, 2001. On that day in Afghanistan, nobody cared about Afghanistan. The world had pretty much turned its back on Afghanistan. International broadcasters were all gone. They didn't care what was going on in the country. Nobody in the West really knew much about the Taliban. Nobody was particularly concerned about the horrible plight of women in Afghanistan. They just turned their back on the country. But Al Jazeera didn't. They actually had a bureau in Kabul all the way through right up to 2001, right up to the 9-11 attacks. And so what happened was, on 9-11, of course, the whole world cared about Afghanistan. Suddenly it was an important country. And the whole world paid attention to it. Al Jazeera, England, or Al Jazeera sorry, found itself behind enemy lines. They were able to have access to a huge part of the story that the rest of the world couldn't. Because the rest of the world's media outlets, they went in with the Northern Alliance from the north, they went in through Pakistan. They weren't in the country, or, or only in the tiny sliver of the country in the north. And Al Jazeera had this exclusive access to a huge part of the story. And as any of the journalists in this room can tell you, having a balanced uh, version of the story is critical to good news reporting. And Al Jazeera was able to provide that. And lots of people started to learn about Al Jazeera because the rest of the media outlets around the world were using our pictures to show what was going on in Afghanistan during the early days of that war. You guys hearing this microphone OK? OK. So balance is important to news stories, but it's not important to a government when it's trying to sell a foreign war. And the American government was trying to sell two foreign wars, first in Afghanistan, later in Iraq. They had a mission to do, the Bush administration. They wanted to sell a war. And having multiple sides of uh, the story coming out wasn't helping them sell their war. The American networks, for the most part, they played along. They played along with the game that the American soldiers were always heroes, could do no wrong. That the Taliban, that the Saddam's forces were always villains, could do no right. It was that simple, and that was how most of the American networks covered the news. If you watch Fox News, they talked about how our boys were doing. There was no impartiality there. It was very uh, one-sided. The American government also developed and, and established and continued to establish a program of embedding reporters with their army. And through programs like that and other programs, the American government was incredibly effective, and the British government as well, incredibly effective at manipulating and controlling the message that went back to the United States, the news coverage, the information people at home were getting. That's how you sell a foreign war. The Bush administration, that was their job. They were out to sell a foreign war, and so I'm not critical of them at all. They had a job to do. Their job was to present a, critical, or to present a foreign war that they could sell, and that's what they did. It was a hard job to do, to, uh, to convince people to uh, support a war on foreign soil. But they did it, and I'd give them an A-plus for their efforts. <laughs> Governments have no responsibility to present a balanced view of information during a time of war. None. Journalists do. That's a journalist's role. That's what we're supposed to do as journalists, is tell different sides of a story, more than one side of a story. Unfortunately, in the lead up to the Iraq war in particular, when the Bush administration was running around trying to justify that war by saying that the, uh, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction that were a threat to the United States of America and its, and its citizens, journalists completely failed to do their job. They didn't present a balanced view of the news, and that, that line was accepted by most Americans. So to take this story back to Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera provided a balanced view of the news. They were telling both sides of the story, multiple sides of a war, including that if you drop thousands of bombs on a city, civilians sometimes get hurt. That was a message the American government didn't want its citizens to hear. It wasn't going to help them sell the war. So the American government was unhappy. Again, they had a job to do. So what they did was they tried to basically silence Al Jazeera. They had discussed bombing Al Jazeera. That probably wouldn't have been a good idea because Qatar was a key ally of the United States. So what they did was they went after Al Jazeera and completely discredited the channel. They tarnished the reputation. They basically assassinated the character of Al Jazeera in the United States. And it's a legacy we live with today. So how did they do this? I thought I'd play you a two-minute clip from a documentary to give you a sense of how the Bush administration managed to, to hurt Al Jazeera's reputation so badly. This is a clip from a documentary called The Control Room. 
the control room was about the war in Iraq, Al Jazeera's coverage of the war in Iraq in particular. So it's from 2003 is when it was filmed. The first clip you're going to hear, I'm just going to play about two minutes of the documentary. The first clip is, you'll see a little bit of an Al Jazeera actual uh, reporting from that day. You'll hear Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense of the United States at the time, talking about Al Jazeera, and then you'll see an Al Jazeera reporter responding and talking about our coverage. <laughs> إذا عندك إنسانية تقدر تشوف طفلة وهي تصيح ماما بابا وين الإنسانية وين الضمير وين الله؟ We know that Al Jazeera has a pattern of playing propaganda over and over and over again. What they do is, is when there's a bomb goes down, they, they grab some children and some women and pretend that the bomb hit the women and the children. And it seems to me that it's up to all of us to try to tell the truth, to say what we know, to say what we don't know, and recognize that we're dealing with people that are perfectly willing to, to lie to the world to attempt to further their case. And to the extent people uh, lie, ultimately they are caught lying and they lose their credibility. And one would think it wouldn't take very long for that to happen dealing with people like this. How about Thank the footage you. of the children? We wanted to show that any war has a human cost. Okay? We focused on that. There is a human cost because we care for the Iraqi people. We are not like Rumsfeld who says we care for the Iraqi people. He doesn't care at all. Okay? We care for them. We are Arabs like them. We are Muslims like them. So that gives you a bit of an idea on how they went after Al Jazeera's reputation. How effective had they been? Well, by 2006, I'll tell you a little personal story. Just before Al Jazeera English launched, about a month before, the Jewish Community Center here in London, Ontario, brought me up to give a talk about how a Canadian Jew found himself at Al Jazeera. And about 70 people packed into a small room and to hear me talk. And they all gathered together, came in, and one of the first questions I asked them in my presentation was, how many people, how many of you have a negative opinion of Al Jazeera? Every hand in the place except for one went up. 69 out of about 70 hands, that's more than 98% of the room, had a strong negative opinion of Al Jazeera. The only one who didn't go up, it turned out, had watched The Control Room, that documentary I just showed you. Then I asked them, how many of you have ever watched Al Jazeera? Not a single hand went up, none. Nobody had watched Al Jazeera. Of course they hadn't, because you needed a satellite dish to watch Al Jazeera. Not only that, if you want to watch Al Jazeera back then, you have to speak Arabic. And most non-Muslims, non-Arabs, sorry, as we know, do not speak Arabic. So they hadn't watched it, they couldn't understand it, if they'd even seen glimpses of it. And yet that didn't stop them from having a very strong negative opinion of what Al Jazeera was about, which to me is very telling and a little bit scary. So that's the story of Al Jazeera's journey from acclaim to infamy. They've arrived at infamy, and Al Jazeera English is now going to show up on the scene. And it brings us to 2006 and the launch of Al Jazeera English and our journey from infamy to acclaim. The journey back from infamy was a long and hard one, especially because so few people could actually watch Al Jazeera English. There's only tiny pockets of the United States where people could watch Al Jazeera English, including the State Department and the White House. They had us in the early days. Very few other people could see Al Jazeera English. And in Canada, nobody could see Al Jazeera English except online. It wasn't until June 2010, sorry, May 2010, that we went on air here. And still to this day in Canada, if you want to watch Al Jazeera English, you've got to request it specially and pay a little bit of extra money to your cable company to see it, which is obviously doing much better than the United States, but I think still it, it's not necessarily reaching a huge audience in Canada. Because people can't watch Al Jazeera English, those strong misconceptions in America, or North America, remained. People continued to fear the station for a long time. They continued to see it as something to be afraid of rather than something to be celebrated because they didn't understand it. What most people don't realize about Al Jazeera English is it's mostly run by Westerners. Uh, those are three Canadians who were at the launch on, uh, in Washington, D.C. when we launched the channel. Most of the staff come from English-speaking countries. We come from Canada, from the United States, 
from Britain, from Australia, from New Zealand. We grew up in the West. We lived in the West. Our values are formed by where we came from. Journalists are supposed to be objective, neutral, and all that stuff. Yes, we are. We strive to be, but we're, you know, we're humans, first and foremost. We're human long before we're journalists. And the, our beliefs, our values, our course going to color the kind of stories we tell. It's where we come from. It's our point of view. It's even the stories we choose to tell is going to be colored by that. In Washington, D.C., too, because we were covering the Americas, we had a lot of people from Latin America in there as well. So our background from where we grew up is Western. Our education, most of us were educated in the West at schools, like at the Faculty of Information and Media Studies. Journalism programs in the West is where we were educated. Where we learned about journalism was from working as journalists. Most of us had worked as professional journalists at places like the CBC, the BBC, CNN. I even had colleagues at, in Washington, D.C. who had come over from Fox News. Those were our understandings of what journalism was. That's our starting point as journalists. Despite this, in 2008, we still had a strong negative uh, reputation in North America. We were being celebrated in many European countries, right from day one, uh, in Germany, I know, five, we reached 5 million viewers on day one. All across Europe, people could watch Al Jazeera, and I would hear from people who traveled there and came back, and I'd hear from my colleagues at the BBC who I used to work with in London, talking about Al Jazeera English. They would say, what you guys are doing is fantastic. It's a great channel. But people in North America couldn't see it and remained afraid of it. I could stand here all night, literally, and tell you stories about the prejudices I've run into because I work for Al Jazeera English. I could tell you the people who refused to do interviews with me. I could tell you about the doors that were closed on me because I was a reporter for Al Jazeera English. But rather than doing that, I'm going to play you a, a little video clip from a more balanced source, from the Washington Post. They went and did a little story about Al Jazeera while we were covering the Democratic Convention in Colorado in 2008. Bad blood, a bitter feud, simmering tensions coming to a boil at a showdown in Colorado. The Democratic National Convention, perhaps? Actually, that's about 13 miles east of here in Denver. The Washington sketch is in Golden, Colorado, to see an equally impressive showdown. The Bikers versus Al Jazeera. Golden is a gold rush town. 18,000 souls live here in the shadow of Lookout Mountain, where Buffalo Bill is buried, the home of Coors Beer, its main street would be convincing as a set for a Hollywood Western. Al Jazeera, the Middle Eastern news network, liked the looks of this place when it went scouting for locations to film during the Democratic National Convention. At first, city leaders welcomed Al Jazeera. The city manager offered to have a barbecue without pork in their honor. But after an outcry by angry citizens at a city council meeting, the barbecue invitation to Al Jazeera was rescinded. Fortunately for Al Jazeera, the owner of the Buffalo Rose, a historic saloon popular with bikers, was more welcoming. He invited them to film from his bar during the Democratic Convention. Time do we start heckling? So, good. But some denizens of Golden were not happy with this solution. They showed up to protest outside the Buffalo Rose. One Iraq War veteran called Al Jazeera enablers of terrorists and the network's film crew traitors to the United States. I don't believe that the newscasters that are here tonight are terrorists. Themselves. No, no, they're, they're Americans. But I, just but I believe that they're traitors to the United States of America. Even these folks here? Absolutely. Yeah. Inside the Buffalo Rose, Al Jazeera determined to show its audience the views of small-town Americans watching the convention assembled a few of them underneath a television in one corner of the bar. The leader of this supposed terrorist cell, a Marine veteran from Texas, partial to blue jeans, cowboy boots, and lattes. And what exactly is the nature of your jihad uh, here at the Buffalo Rose? I guess you call it a mild jihad for the truth. Uh, we've just come to, to show our international audience uh, what small town America is thinking about the, the political circus that, that's happening just up the road in big city Denver. The demonstrators determined to thwart Al Jazeera come armed with patriotic hymns. We are hiding behind the First Amendment. I 
can't walk into this bar and scream fire. Your First Amendment's bullshit. They were dead set against Al Jazeera, even if they weren't quite sure what it was. Al Jazeera, yeah, they're a, a terrorist-sponsored uh, broadcast place. People. A couple of the protesters ventured across the street to confront the patrons at the Buffalo Rose. But the patrons were not impressed. All right. Gives you a sense, I hope, of that. And I'll end it there uh, with that video. But strong, strong negative opinions about Al Jazeera English, despite the fact they have no idea who we are or what we are. So when did, that repu when did our reputation start to shift from infamy to acclaim? The war in Gaza was the first big moment, the a big shift for us. And that started in uh, late 2008, December 2008. So just a couple months, a few months after that uh, Democratic Convention. Al Jazeera English was the only international broadcaster in the Gaza Strip when the war started. What you need to know is that Western, most Western journalists, well, all Western journalists, most international journalists, they would live in Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem, in nice condos, nice apartments. When something big would happen in the Gaza Strip or the West Bank, they hop in their cars and they drive in, do their reporting, and get the heck out. Same day. Al Jazeera actually had a bureau in the Gaza Strip. So when the war started, we were there. And Israel, the day the war started, cut off all foreign journalists. They blockaded the Gaza Strip. Nobody was allowed in. So foreign journalists could not report on what was actually going on in the Gaza Strip. So everybody turned to Al Jazeera English in the English-speaking world because we were there, we could show what was going on. And we had a couple of reporters in there doing lives nonstop almost and reporting constantly about what was going on in the Gaza Strip. We had exclusive access to a massive part, a major part of an important war that was going on, a war that the world was watching. Our coverage earned us widespread praise and got us a lot of attention. The LA Times said, say what you will about Al Jazeera, but the landmark Arab satellite news channel has absolutely led the pack in conveying the realities of the ongoing Israeli assault on the Gaza Strip. The war in Gaza was a big step forward for us. It really helped establish our credibility here in North America. It made a big difference. But it was the Arab Spring that really transformed how people in this part of the world see Al Jazeera English. The Arab Spring started in Tunisia, uh, just under a year ago, at the end of last year. And it, it continues to this day. Governments, non-democratic governments, have fallen in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Libya. There have been civil uprisings in Bahrain, in Syria, and in Yemen as well. And a protest in about half a dozen other countries, including Iran. As most of you probably know, social media played an important and key role in the early days of the Arab Spring and of the uprisings. And Al Jazeera played a key role as well. We were telling people in the region the stories about what was going on in the world, about what was going on in those uprisings. It's where people turn to. And what you need to understand, especially in the Arab world, is that Al Jazeera is the most respected name in news by far in the Arab world. So people turned to Al Jazeera to see what was going on, to try to understand what was going on. And by watching Al Jazeera, they felt like they were getting the best sense possible of what was actually happening in those uprisings. They're getting a balanced view of the news and an understanding of what was really going on. And that news inspired people to rise up as well in other countries. The news coming out of Tunisia and then Egypt and then Libya inspired people in other countries to rise up, demand their rights, voice their oppositions to their governments, something that was rarely done in the Middle East. In Egypt, protesters, protesters could be heard chanting, long live Al Jazeera. The Egyptian government was so afraid of what Al Jazeera was doing there, so afraid of what we were up to, that they tried to shut down our satellite transmissions. They saw us as a threat, as that much of a threat. They tried to shut down our offices, and they de did detain and arrest some of our journalists. Again, our coverage got its widespread praise. And the Huffington Post, for example, said, the Arab Spring would not have been possible without Al Jazeera. The New York Times said, CNN had the Gulf War, Fox News, News had the war on terror, and Al Jazeera English had the Arab Spring. It was a major turning point for Al Jazeera in the world. 
and a major, major turning point here in North America for how people saw us. People who once feared the station suddenly realized this was something to be celebrated. This was a positive force in the world. We had journeyed a long way down that road from infamy to acclaim. Which brings me to the third part of my talk today, which is why Canadians need Al Jazeera English. And I want to start by reading a quote from a Washington Post reporter. And it, re it uh, is related directly to the United States, but it also works well for Canada, I think. Pamela Constable from the Washington Post wrote, our economy, economy is intimately linked to global markets. Our population is nearly 20% foreign born, and our lives are directly affected by borderless scourges, such as global warming and AIDS. Knowing about the world is not a luxury. It is an urgent necessity. Knowing about the world is not a luxury anymore. It's an urgent necessity. And Al Jazeera English has the potential to meet that need, that necessity. We do things differently at Al Jazeera than a lot of the other networks do. Just starting even from the stories we choose to tell. And in the United States, and of course a lot of our television comes from the United States, and our Canadian television is very influenced by the coverage in the United States and the news channels in the United States, the constant chase for ratings in the United States has forced, in the last 20 or 30 years, or led a lot of TV news channels, the American networks, to lead in the direction of focusing a lot more on sensational news on news that was once the mainstay of tabloid newspapers. Stories like Paris Hilton, for example. A few years ago, you might remember she was arrested. Well, she was arrested many times. A few years ago, she was actually thrown in jail. She served 23 days of, I'm sure, very hard time for her crime of driving with a suspended license, which was, I think, suspended for drinking and driving on an earlier date. CNN and all the American networks thought this was massive news when she was let out of jail after 23 days. They went wall to wall on their coverage. CNN actually, their special coverage that they had, I don't know if you can see it there, it says Paris liberated. Harking back to the important days of World War II when that other Paris <laughs> was liberated. They treated this like it was heavy, important, super duper crucial news and the world couldn't live without it. Wall to wall coverage. Starting from pretty much the minute she got out of jail, CNN was promoing the fact that her first live TV interview was going to be on CNN with Larry King Live, which happened the very next day after she got out of jail, which is one thing. So she spent an hour talking to Larry King. And after that, CNN kept going with it. And Anderson Cooper, who's a journalist I have a lot of respect for, he's been all over the world. He's done some really good reporting. Even his show had to devote an entire hour to Paris Hilton. If you, I'm going to play you about a three-minute clip of it just to give you a sense of it. If you listen, you can hear how pissed off he is, I think, about having to do this. Paris Hilton earlier tonight, joining me now to talk about what we've all witnessed. Public relations consultant Ken Sunshine, he represents a who's who of Hollywood. Mark Lamont Hill, professor of American studies at Temple University. Court TV's Lisa Bloom. And Jess Cagle of People magazine, who scored the exclusive print interview with a freed femme fatale at her grandfather's home in Bel Air right after her release from jail. Jess, you talked to, to her for People. Is the person we saw tonight the real Paris Hilton? I think that there is um, there's something that has definitely changed about her. What you what you feel when you meet her in person is, she she does seem like a much more substantial person than this kind of uh, bubblehead or what she calls a, a cartoon character that she plays on the simple life and and I think kind of has fostered over the years in the media. I think that she regrets that to to an extent and is very very eager to be seen as, as a more substantial person, a more serious person, as she said over and over to, uh, what, to Larry. What does that really mean, though? I mean, she's 26 years old. Why hasn't she been substantial up to now? I mean, she's had plenty of time. You know, I, I know she didn't go to college. I know she got a GED. Uh, but, you know, she, she certainly has had, had access to newspapers and information. It seems odd to her to suddenly get smart. Well, what strikes you about her also is she's, she's, she's very sweet. Um, she's very polite. She does seem rather immature, and that, that is the thing that strikes you. It was interesting to hear her talk to Larry about how she has been, uh, how she has behaved rather immaturely in her life. So maybe this experience has matured her. I mean, only time will tell. I certainly didn't get the sense that she was being insincere when she said she wanted to do more charity work and, and all of that. Though a lot of people who go to jail say they've found God, and you have to see what happens after that. Yeah, I mean, Ken, uh, she talks about finding God and working with charities. I found it telling, though, when Larry asked her what personality trait she most wanted to change, it was sort of an opportunity to be self-reflective and say, you know what, I've made some mistakes. Here's what she said. 
When I get nervous or shy, my voice gets really high. I've been doing that ever since I was a little girl. And uh, that's something I don't like that I do. I like when I talk in my normal voice, but sometimes I go down and that's something I'm trying to change about myself. Does, does she seem like somebody who has been changed by this experience? I mean, do you buy this? No. Uh, I think she comes across as relatively normal, a little boring, uh, clearly not uh, very thoughtful. Should uh, she be doing one-hour interviews? Because i got to tell you, if, if part of being a celebrity <laughs> is creating a mystique about somebody, she's destroying it every time she opens that, that, that lip gloss mouth. Uh, you ought to be in PR. Uh, is she, uh, no, she should not do one-hour interviews. In fact, she should... You get the idea. That goes on for an hour. <laughs> Al Jazeera English takes a different approach uh, to telling the news, as I mentioned. On the day of Paris Hilton's release, we covered this other story. We didn't actually touch the Paris Hilton story at all. Our lead story that day was the fact that in Baghdad, a series of uh, coordinated suicide bomb car bombings killed more than 200 people, people out during their shopping at markets. People in a country that the United States had started a war in, we sort of thought that might be a little bit more important than the Paris, Paris liberation. I'm not sure how many people actually watch Al Jazeera and, instead of Paris being liberated, but nothing we can do about that. So as this example shows, Al Jazeera is a great place for people and North Americans and Canadians to turn to if they want an alternative take on the news and if they want to get a better understanding of what's going on in the world. Al Jazeera has tremendous reach. We have about 70 bureaus. Al Jazeera English has about 70 bureaus around the world. We reach about 250 million viewers. So we reach about a quarter of a billion people who can watch Al Jazeera English. And that's in about 120 countries, more than 120 countries around the world. With that kind of reach, with the reporting we do, we can help people from different countries, from different religions, from different backgrounds, from different parts of the world get a better understanding of each other, to learn to understand each other and not to be afraid of each other. That's the potential of a channel like Al Jazeera English. So why should you care? One of the things that a lot of Canadians might not be aware of, unless they're journalists, is that Canadian, Canadians are uh, turning away from the world, are pulling back from the world. Canadian media, outlet, media outlets are pulling back from the, the world. This closing foreign bureaus around the world. And the CBC, for example, they now cover almost all of Asia with a bureau in Beijing. A few people in Beijing cover an area of the world that includes more than two billion people. I don't care if you've got the best reporters in the world in there, you cannot do justice to two billion stories with a couple of reporters. You're going to miss a lot, a lot of news. And the CBC is not alone. Most Canadian networks, most American networks, they're shutting down their foreign bureaus as well. They just don't think that the amount of money they put into those foreign bureaus is coming back to them. It's worth their cost, worth their trouble. So they're pulling back from the world. And there's a downside to that approach. That's sometimes you wake up and you find something out about the world that you didn't know. And Americans on 9-11, suddenly many of them found out that parts of the world don't like them. They were shocked to learn that a lot of parts of the world don't think the United States is quite as wonderful as Amer most Americans do. That not everybody agrees the United States is the best country in the world. It can be dangerous. And I don't think we should feel too smug as Canadians either, because just last year we got a good slap in the face as well as we, tried to find, as we started to find out that the world doesn't like our foreign policies either. Last October, we were turned down from a seat on the UN Security Council. Every time since World War II, since the UN was formed, when we've asked for a seat on the Security Council, we've been given that seat. And October last year, the seat that should have been ours went to Portugal. And again, it was a slap in the face to our country. Conservative leader Stephen Harper, he tried to explain this away by blaming it on Michael Ignatieff, the liberal leader, and said, you know, it's because of comments Michael Ignatieff made in the House of Commons, that's why we didn't get our seat on the Security Council. People I've talked to at the United Nations say that's ridiculous. It's a load of BS. The reasons we, are not, we did not get a seat on the UN Security Council is because our reputation around the world, Canada's reputation around the world, is fallen. We started peacekeeping. Lester B. Pearson won the Nobel Peace Prize because of our role in peacekeeping. We don't do peacekeeping anymore except maybe in a, you know, a dozen people or something. We do peace creation or something in Afgan countries like Afghanistan. Mining companies around the world 
60% of the world's mining companies are in Canada. Many of them are accused of human rights abuses in developing countries around the world. In dozens of developing countries around the world, mining companies that are seen as Canadian are accused of human rights abuses. Rightly or wrongly, environmentalists have convinced many parts of the world that the oil from the oil sands is dirty oil. That's hurting our reputation around the world. They've convinced people that the tar sands is dirty oil, it's arm environmental Armageddon. That sort of stuff hurts our reputation around the world. Those are the reasons why we don't get a seat on the UN Security Council. Watching Al Jazeera English can help Canadians understand what's happening in the world and help Canadians understand how the world sees us. Al Jazeera English is also can offer a terrific alternative source of news. And some people might ask, why are alternative sources of news important? Well, because any one news organization is just going to give you one thin slice of the news. That's all they can do. They've all got agendas. They've all got um, things, are, you know, roles they're supposed to play. And if you want to understand what's going on in the world, you need it much more than one thin slice of the news. I want to talk about this word for a minute, this idea of truth. And it's something that I think a lot of people think they're getting when they read the newspaper, when they watch the nightly newscasts on CBC, CTV. We think we're getting the truth. And in a way, we are getting the truth, but we're getting one piece of the truth, one slice of the truth. We're getting one part of the truth. I've worked in public relations, as Jamili said. I uh, helped run Iraq's elections after the fall of Saddam Hussein. I know a thing or two about spinning the news. A lot of people out there like me know a thing or two about spinning the news. When I worked at the United Nations, I used to have a rep in Baghdad, I had a reputation as somebody who could make shit smell good. That was a compliment, I'm told. <laughs> I could spin stories. And I can, if you give me a set of six facts, I can tell you a story many different ways. They would all be accurate. They would all be a truth. But they might be very different stories. And probably none of them would be balanced. If you take, for example, the Occupy London movement, crackdown that happened last week here in London, when the police moved in, I could tell you a story using the facts about how wonderful the police were. Nobody was arrested. There was no violent confrontations. The police moved in, got rid of the mess, were very open to welcoming the protesters back the next day. It was a wonderful story for the police. I could also tell you a story about how the police were just a bunch of jerks, how they waited until midnight, until all the journalists had gone home before they went in and took down those tents because they didn't want anybody to be able to visually see or show what they were up to. And I could go on in that tangent as well. You can tell very different stories using the exact same facts, just by spinning the news. And it's important to remember that everybody has an agenda, everyone. And organizations, companies, governments, they often use the media to get their message out there, to put out their view of the world, their spin on the news. They're very effective at it. Governments, companies, they have huge public relations teams working to control how the media spreads information. And journalists are overworked, understaffed, and we're susceptible to having our news spun. And that's why you need to get your news from various sources, not just from one source, not just from one location. That's the only way you're going to avoid being sucked into somebody else's propaganda. And Al Jazeera English is a great place to turn to if you want an alternative source of international news. Part of the story that I haven't touched on is that as Canadian media outlets have been pulling back from the world, the world has all but turned its back on Canada. Al Jazeera English is the only international TV broadcaster with a bureau in Canada. Nobody else has one. We op only opened it up in June 2010, just last year. Until then, there was no international broadcasters here. Most of the big newspapers in the world, they don't keep anybody in Canada either. They cover Canada from Washington, D.C. or from New York. People who live in Washington, D.C. and New York, if they're British, if they're Japanese, if they're Americans, they don't know a whole lot about Canada to begin with. So unless the story appears in the Washington Post or the New York Times, we're not making the news, the international news. People don't care about Canada. And if you doubt this, the next time you're overseas, ask somebody you meet if they know what the capital of Canada is. You'd be amazed at how few people can name Ottawa. One of the reasons I wanted to move back to Canada was because I wanted to give Canada a voice. I wanted to be with my wife, of course, but I also wanted to give Canada a voice. Uh, and one of Al Jazeera English's goals is to give a voice to the voiceless. It's our slogan, one of our slogans. And again, as far as the international media is concerned, Canada has no voice. 
So in, two, uh, in 2007, in the summer, I moved back to London, and until June last year, I was the only one in the whole country covering stories for Al Jazeera English. It was kind of my own, my own little beat, Canada. <laughs> and some days I wished I was a print journalist, because you travel a whole lot lighter than that. Uh, most of what I do is working as a video journalist, traveling around on my own with a camera uh, and doing my own reporting and sort of a one-man band type thing. On bigger stories, Al Jazeera English will fly in a reporter and a cameraman and we'll work together as a team. They come in from Washington or other parts of the world. And I've got to say, being a foreign correspondent in your own country is a sweet, sweet job. I had the entire country to choose from, stories across you know, 35 million people. I could pick and choose from the stories and can't pick and choose from the stories across the country that I'm interested in, that I think our international audience will be interested in. I can tell Al Jazeera's international audience about issues and ideas that I think they should know about Canada. When I put a story on Al Jazeera English, millions of people around the world in dozens, if not more than 100 countries, are going to gain a new insight into an issue that's important to Canadians, are going to learn about our, one of our communities, are going to learn about part of our culture. So some of the stories that I've covered are US war resistors who are trying to stay in Canada and seek refugee status in this country. They've come to Canada because they think the war in Iraq is immoral and illegal and they don't want to fight it, and they've tried to stay here. I've done stories about Canada's um, apology for a native residential school system. That happened in June 11, 2008. And that's a picture of me with uh, the Assembly of First Nations Chief Phil Fontaine. He's the head of the First Nations, or was at the time. He was on the House of Commons floor when Stephen Harper issued his apology. And the first interview he did after leaving Parliament Hill was to come over and talk to me for Al Jazeera English. Murray St. Clair, that's uh, my reporter Steve Chow interviewing him. He's the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, so we've done stories about that. We were out in Winnipeg last year doing a story about that. I've done stories about Vancouver gang violence and about its ties to international crime. I've done stories, uh, several stories, about Canada's role in Afghanistan. And it's a role that I think a lot of Canadians actually feel quite proud of. I know most Canadians feel very proud of our soldiers. If you watch Don Cherry on Hockey Night in Canada, you can't help but to notice that fact. It's also a, a story that many people around the world don't know anything about. Lots of parts of the world don't realize that Canada played a significant role in the war in Afghanistan. And that was a story I wanted to get out. Last year, I went to Alberta to do a couple of stories about the oil sands and uh, found myself in Fort McMurray. For those of you who don't know, Fort McMurray is sort of the unofficial capital of the oil sands. And some, it's a boom town. Some people would point out that the oil sands is driving Canada's economy right now, where basically we have a petrol currency. Our dollar rises and falls with the price of oil. Other people would argue that this is the worst thing happening in the world right now, what's going on in Alberta. That again, it's environmental Armageddon, ground zero for global warming, and it should you know, be shut down ASAP. So my interest in going to do the story is I wanted to look at the public relations battle between the uh, environmentalists and the oil industry. In a public relations war, this may not be the best way to make a first impression. Security guards from the company Shell tried to prevent us from filming oh, near their mining oh, excuse site. Me. Sorry. Can you tell us no, why you're doing that? that and why aren't we allowed to film? It's private property. This is private property. property. Mm -hmm. But that's over on that side. There is a sign and a fence marking where the oil company's property begins. We are outsiders. Regardless, made to feel unwelcome, we leave. Soon after, we notice we're being followed. We've already left the area, but still, one of Shell's security vehicles continues to shadow us. He's been following us for at least half an hour. He's taken photos, all this while we're on a public highway. Before this, we'd been talking to two people who see the oil sands very differently. When you first take the material off, of course, there is nowhere to put it. Don Thompson is a former CEO of one of the world's largest oil companies. Well, these ponds, from your assessment, are extremely toxic. They are. I mean, what they consist of is nymphatic acids. And Melina um, Massimo oil, is from Greenpeace. Cyanide, mercury, lead, like heavy metal. The environmental group has staged a slick and aggressive campaign against what it calls the most destructive project on the planet. This was a protest at Shell's facility last year. 
resides after. Massimo, um, who is also from the Aboriginal group in the region, calls what's happening environmental Armageddon. People that have lived here for generations upon generations, First Nation communities, have seen the drastic change in the environment. So it's not only environmentalists that are saying, you know, there's an issue here. So you remember what this place used to be like? It used to be a big dirt hill. The issue, says Thompson, is that environmentalists are painting a distorted picture of the industry. He shows us how a former mine is being restored to its natural beauty. What do we have here? That's a happy poplar tree. <laughs> Oil companies are spending millions on advertising campaigns, arguing the pollution created is no more destructive than other ways of getting oil out of the ground. In the short term, there's no doubt we have an environmental footprint. We strip trees, we strip soil, and we mine uh, the oil sands. But on the other hand, we put the sand back in the mine pits, we put the reclamation material on top, and we create landscapes like this. this but beyond our time with Thompson, the oil companies the themselves the proved the, uncooperative. The trees that you now see uh, growing uh, up in front of you. While Massimo drove 14 hours to tell the environmentalist side of things. 36 um, megatons of greenhouse gas emissions from the Alberta tar sands. The companies rejected Al Jazeera's requests for a tour of their operations three times over two years. And then there was the security. After following us a long way down a public highway, we stopped to ask why. So, just so we're clear, Al Jazeera English still has its critics. Some more extreme than others. Not surprisingly, Bill O'Reilly from Fox News is one of our critics. He's tried to uh, brand Al Jazeera as anti-Semitic and anti-American. And he said that if you peer on Al Jazeera to denounce Islamists, you'll get a bullet in, right in the head when you walk out. That's a, a recent comment. However, many people are changing their minds. John McCain, who of course was the uh, Republican candidate who ran against uh, Barack Obama in the last uh, presidential election in the States, he recently said, what Al Jazeera has done is achieve something that all of us, I think, want to achieve as we grow older. And that is to make a contribution that will last and be brought to future generations that lie ahead of us. Those are kind words. And on a more personal level, uh, since the Arab Spring started, I've personally had people come up to me, thank me, shake my hand, and congratulate me for the coverage of Al Jazeera and Al Jazeera English. Um, I've also had lots of nice feedback in different ways. And David Spencer uh, is one of them. He's a professor here at FIMS who's taught journalism for more than 30 years. And recently, I went into his office and he had a student sitting there. And he introduced me to his student and he said, this is Jeremy Copeland. He works for the best news organization in the world. I had to like, try to actually think that that was true and he actually said it, that's what he said. And it was shocking, I was stunned to hear that. But that's kind of the reputation we now have. And it's really, really, considering where we came from five years ago, considering the reaction I've had some of the times when I've been out working for Al Jazeera English, to get that kind of acclaim is sweet. It's really nice. And that's where we're sort of at these days. So before I open this up to questions, I just want to do a follow-up to uh, um, the last time I talked about Al Jazeera English here in London, Ontario. That's, of course, when I went to the Jewish Community Center and asked them about their opinions of Al Jazeera. So I just want to do that here. So can I just get a show of hands of how many people have actually watched Al Jazeera English or have looked at our website. Okay, you can hold them up high. The sun, there's nobody here from Sun TV who's gonna take your picture and uh, <laughs> report you. Okay, so a good chunk of the room. And how many people have a negative opinion of Al Jazeera? Are you just afraid or? Okay, <laughs> that's good because we do have a camera here and we are taking pictures. So. That's not a scientific survey, but that kind of shows me a general sense of what I'm getting when I go out there and, and report for Al Jazeera English still to this day. And that shows me that we have come a long way on the road from infamy to acclaim. And I'll end it there and open it up to questions.